Hi there. I wanted to pop in today to introduce you to a special guest, a friend of mine. Her name is Uma Girish, and she was first introduced to me um, through her book. In fact, she'd written a book called Finding uh, Losing Ama, and and it was the, um, and in the book she spoke about the loss of her mother, who she was really, really close to. And when I started reading the book, I couldn't put it down. And then by um, a state of, I guess, synchronicities or good fortune, I met her through, I guess, through Skype, and we've been in communication ever since. And she has been taking people, she's been doing work with people, coaching people, working with people, taking them from their pain to purpose. And I highly recommend her work. And today I wanted to introduce her to my audience. And so here she is, Uma Girish. Hi, Uma. It's so great to have you on my show. And I think so many people in my audience will love and resonate with what you do. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me here, Anita. It's such an honor to be here. I've admired your work and what you, your message, that the message you take out into the world. And um, so it's, it's my great pleasure to be here. Yeah, so I'd just like to explain a little bit about what I do as a grief guide. There's a reason why I call myself a grief guide. It's because I believe that when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one work with somebody, I'm companioning them on the journey. I'm almost like a Sherpa and the grieving person has to climb this tall mountain. And as they're climbing, I'm with them, alongside them. I'm pointing them to the pitfalls to avoid. When they get tired, they have my shoulder to lean on. And together we take this long journey. It takes as much time as it takes but I'm with them as their companion and guide. And when we get to the top of the mountain, they're tired, they're weary, but they're also exhilarated because they have the perspective of a brand new view. It's, it's a panoramic view which they're seeing on the other side of loss. So that's where the purpose comes in. The, the part of the work that really excites me when I do it with clients is helping them gather up all the shattered pieces of themselves and then putting those pieces back together in a way that forms a new mosaic. They become a new self. And when they become this new self, they are able to take the pain of this awful thing that happened to them and offer it as a thing of beauty in the world. So that's the purpose that many people come to. Um, pain is always, I believe, a portal to transformation. Pain is a portal to purpose. And when you can really take your pain and make it work in service of humanity, that is when pain be begins to have meaning instead of it being something terrible that drags you down and keeps you depressed. That's so beautifully said. It really is. Uh, you know, you, you really have a way with words, but then it's your heart. You have such a big heart. Because one of the things I've noticed is that on my, um, when I do my Facebook Lives or even in my Facebook group, when people post about their pain and their grief, you're in there helping them, answering them. It's like it's part of who you are. It's your nature. And, uh, and so that's why I feel you have been such a blessing to me because so many people in my audience are going through pain and grief and, and I so want to be there for them and yet I feel I can't be there for all of them. And also what I find, in, what I find wonderful is that you actually have the, the tools for want of a better word and the right things to say and the right things to do and the right steps for them to take to help them climb out of that pain and to see it even even if it feels like a, sh a long shot from where they are in that moment you help them to finally see it as something that could um, that could really be the fire behind them to take them to the next level and I love that I love the way you do that and the way you just explained it and, and in fact, I just want to tell my audience members right now that if you have questions for Uma, please post them now and we'll get to them in a little bit. She's happy to answer your questions. So post them now. And at the end of this, uh, this conversation, I'm also going to give you information of how you can contact um, Uma directly and how you can 
uh, and whatever else she's offering, whether she's offering courses, videos, whatever, but also how you can find more of her and get more of her and contact her directly. So, um, uh, so while Danny's looking through to find the questions, is there anything you can say? Maybe tell us a little bit about your own journey through grief with your, when you lost your mom. Yeah, that was 10 years ago um, that my mother died. 2019 is actually her 10th anniversary. Um, we moved from India when I was 44 years old. We moved to the United States. We moved to Chicago where we live now, my husband, my daughter and I. And um, 10 days after we moved into our apartment here, my mother in India was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And that news just devastated me because that's not what I had planned. I, we came here with, you know, um, six suitcases and hearts full of dreams, uh, ready to embark on a brand new adventure in a brand new country. But life had other plans for me. And so I actually got on a plane and went back to India. I was with her for six weeks as she went through chemo. Um, my father was bedridden by then. She was his primary caregiver. And so I needed the, I, I knew the family needed support at the time. Uh, when I left India and said goodbye to her, I didn't know that was the last goodbye because she died eight months after her initial diagnosis. And when I came back here, it was winter time. It was my very first winter, the very first time I was seeing snow. I had never seen snow in my life before. And uh, I was just in, in the abyss of darkness. I was just so sad and so depressed because I didn't have friends. I didn't know anybody here. I, didn't, I was just about learning how to drive. Everything was brand new and I didn't have a support system. But my mother's death really woke me up to the big life questions. I still remember a singular image of her body lying on the floor of her living room. You know, in India, the body is brought to the house before it goes to the crematorium on its final journey. And when her body was dying there and we just finished all her last rites, I stepped back and I had this moment where I thought, She's leaving with the only garment on her body. That's all she's taking with her. That beautiful silk sari that we wrapped her body in. And I thought to myself, why do we spend our entire lives accumulating and acquiring and chasing after possessions? And in that moment, I realized that all we get to leave behind is how well we loved and how well we lived. So I thought that should be the focus of our lives. We should really be creating love while we are still here, how we love other people, how we create a legacy, how we leave a heart imprint on the world. And in that moment, I made it my life's mission that I was going to live my life purposefully with a lot of love and create my legacy and leave my heart print. And that's really what brought me to this line of work. Yeah. Wow. That is so beautifully said, and that is exactly what you've been doing. You really are a living example of what you're talking about. I can truly vouch for that in the time that I've known you. And we've got the questions coming in. Um, so I've got one popped up on my screen from Charlie Diamond. The question is, while you're in the middle of it, how do you keep faith and hope when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel? How do you put yourself out there just one more time in vulnerability when you've been hurt so many times before? How do you heal from the agony of rejection so that you can get up and do it all again? In the midst of deep suffering, um, now got a notification for this, can't help but fe feel it's meant to be. Ah, so in the midst of deep suffering, you got a notification for this video. So you can't help but feel it's meant to be. Yes, absolutely. I think it's meant to be, Charlie. So, um, Omar, what would you say to Charlie or to anyone out there who is suffering in the same way that Charlie is? Um, Charlie, the first thing I want to say is my heart goes out to you. This is a really difficult journey that we on, on this human experience have to go on. There's no way we can avoid pain and loss on the journey. Um, but I think what you need to do is just take the next breath, the next step, 
the next moment. That's all we can do when we are in that place of intense grief. You can't plan the day, the week, the month. You have to say, what do I do next? What do I do in the next moment? And the other piece I want to say to you is it's so important to find a group of people who can support you, who can be with you, who can sit with you in the fire of loss, because not everybody can do it. It is very hard for people to be with you as you're grieving a loss because you grieve on your timeline. And most of this culture wants us to grieve on their timeline. It doesn't work like that. So find even two or three people who can be with you and hold your hand and just do what you need to do. You have to become almost selfish about self-care when you're grieving. That's so important. I love that. What you said was that find people who can be with you on your timeline. <clears throat> and what I love is also you said you have to almost become selfish about self-care. I would actually remove the word almost. And I think when you're that deep and in such a dark place, um, I think you do have to become selfish and you have to be okay with being selfish. And so what you say is so important. And I'm not correcting you. I'm actually endorsing what you say by saying remove the word almost. In fact, absolutely 100%. Um, when you're going through such a dark place, it becomes about survival. And yes, it is literally just breathe the next breath. That's really right. Beautiful. He also asked about he also asked about vulnerability and rejection. What I want to say is you want to protect your heart at a time like this because you're raw and broken. And so it's it's like I said, just have a trusted few people that are with you that can be with you during this time. Don't get into relationship dramas or family struggles. Be very protective of your time and space. That's really, really important. That's really good advice. And, and even if it's one or two people in the beginning, even that's fine to start with. That's, right. yeah, that's really good. We have a question from JC King. Why do we have to suffer in physical or emotional ways? What are the purposes? Okay, that's, that's a, that's, hi JC, I recognize, um, I recognize you and thank you for following me on Facebook. And that's a great question and it's a, it's a big question. And I wonder if there is in fact any way out of complete suffering in life. What are your views on that, uh, Omar? So from everything that I know and have lived all these years of my life, I know that this is Earth school and our soul comes here, our soul chooses to be here to learn certain lessons. So suffering is not personal because everybody suffers. The moment you step into that individual bubble and say, no one feels pain like me, I'm the worst affected, life is unfair, I always get the raw deal. You become identified with your suffering and it's almost like there's nothing but pain in your experience. But when we are suffering, it's always, I always tell my clients, close your eyes and think of all the women or all the men in the world who are going through the exact same thing that you are. And almost imagine like you're a human chain holding hands. And you're going to feel a little less alone with just that visual because you're not the only one. Pain is part of the human experience and pain can really open you up if you use it purposefully. So your question really is beautiful, Jay-Z, because um, you ask what is the purpose of suffering? It is up to you to open yourself up through suffering to find your purpose. And when you do that, your pain is not in vain. That's, that's so true. I really like that visual. And imagine if your visual was thinking of everyone on the planet that has the same problem that you do and that you're holding hands in a circle with every single one of those people. And, you, and in that visual, you don't feel alone because you realize you're not the only one with the problem. And yes, and suffering isn't personal. We all suffer. Um, the, the other thing about suffering is that... Um, we tend to make it worse by judging ourselves for suffering. And that's something we can stop doing. We can stop judging ourselves when we're suffering. We kind of think, 
oh, what am I doing wrong? Why am I deserve, you know, why I didn't deserve this. I'm a good person. And so what you're insinuating is that you must have done something wrong for this to happen to you. But that's not the case. Very often suffering is to take you to the next level of life and it's not personal. So yeah, that's a great response. Right. Um, yeah, thank you. They're all thanking you. JC's thanking you. Charlie's thanking you. Um, so yes, and JC loves that uh, you called it Earth School. That's incredible. So thanks. Any more questions we thanks. have? And anything, the questions are coming in. And uh, as someone else, Alice Leonard says she loves that visual of holding hands. Great. And in Thank fact, you. yeah. So tell me a little bit more about what the work you do. Oh, hold on. Before I get to that question, we have Linda Falquez says, how did you get through the grief about your mother's passing? So that's specifically so Linda, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Linda is in my Facebook group, so I recognize her. Huge shout out to you, Linda. Thank you for being here. Um, how did I get through my suffering? I think that was the moment that broke me open. Um, the first thing I did was I did not judge my suffering. I think that's a very, very big piece of it. Anita, you alluded to that. And I want to underscore that I didn't judge my suffering. I allowed myself to cry buckets of tears. I allowed myself to be weak um, and do what I needed to. I joined a grief support group, although I didn't know anybody here. I walked into that room very courageously, not knowing anybody. And it was this large hall in a church. Um, but the, the grief support that I got for nine weeks from that space was really invaluable. Um, and I really started diving more into what is this thing called death? Why do we come here? What, how are we meant to live? How are we meant to find our purpose? I began to really explore those questions deeply. And I say explore because we are going to be exploring it as long as we are alive. There are no um, you know, whole and complete answers to things like purpose and suffering. They're very big cosmic concepts. They're, they're the grand mysteries of life. So we'll never get to a place of understanding with our limited human brain, as marvelous as our brain is. Um, so I, for me, it was about understanding what I'm meant to do here. And then I really said, I am going to make this pain in my life count. This has happened in my life for a reason. I'm going to live bigger and better because of what happened to me. I'm not going to let this diminish me. And I think if you can make a choice, choice is the only thing we have when we are grieving intensely. I want you to hear that loud and clear, every one of you. We get to choose from one moment to next. Am I going to be diminished by this pain? Am I going to contract? Am I going to say no to life? Or am I going to live a more expanded life? Because I know now that time is finite. I need to get busy. I need to prioritize my life and really give time to what matters. What matters is my soul values. How am I going to create this life of beauty? And so that's how I um, overcame my personal loss, Linda. I hope that answers your question. And that's a, actually what stood out for me and what you said was choice is the only thing we have in every given moment. That's actually very beautiful and it's so true that, you know, are we going to, um, are we going to let this diminish us or are we going to live bigger because of it? That's really great. Now, I have a question which um, is because of you know, people write to me all the time and, and ask me questions that is not being posted right now. But something that's come up time and again is when um, I've had people write to me and say that they lost a loved one through suicide. Their loved one took their own life. And because their loved one has taken their own life, they almost feel guilty and for not preventing it or being there. Or if they have a loved one that has taken their life through means of um, like an overdose or something like that, then the person grieving almost feels like they don't have a right to grieve because they feel people are judging them. So um, 
So I have had people write in to me and say things like that, that they feel guilty as if they could have prevented it or it was their fault and they weren't there for that person. And so they don't talk about it because they're afraid to say that, oh, I feel guilty. And so they don't allow themselves to grieve and not publicly anyway. And that adds an extra burden. And, I, and uh, I've come across a few people in that situation. So I would love to have a few words to tell them. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. A lot of people wrestle with that. Um, the first thing I want to say is you are not responsible. You are not responsible for what happened because you, d you didn't make the choice. They did. And this exactly. is not, I'm not saying this with any kind of blame. I'm saying that the pain of being here and feeling like they were fenced in and not getting what they needed was far more painful than the pain of leaving. So their choice to leave wasn't because they didn't love you or they wanted to hurt you or they didn't take your feelings into consideration. Their pain was so magnified. I mean, I don't think we can even begin to understand the pain that people who take their own lives go through. Um, so the first thing I want to say is you are not responsible and they didn't do it to get back at you or place you in this space of pain. Um, I think that from what I understand, their soul made the choice to leave. We can think many times that we control other people's lives. We actually don't. You know, whether the person died through suicide or not, even with my mother's death, you know, we, we were thinking maybe we should have got another doctor's opinion. Maybe we should have caught this sooner. There's always a maybe or a what if. But I think what we need to understand is we don't have control over another person's soul journey. Their cho soul chose to leave at the exact moment it did, and there's nothing that we could have said or done that could have prevented it. So if you are able to hear this and receive this, you will know that you were in no way responsible for their passing. So I just want, to hear, want you to hear that loud and clear because so many people spend the rest of their lives blaming themselves, thinking they could have done something to stop it. I want you to know that you couldn't have because they decided to leave. Their soul chose to leave and they will learn certain lessons through that choice they made. They came here with a certain plan, a certain soul map. And for some reason, they took certain detours that were not part of the plan. And this was the choice they made to take their own lives. But they then, on the other side, they learned certain lessons as a result of the choice they made. So you have to find a way to make peace with the fact that you didn't have anything to do with this. You didn't cause it. You're not talking to them for one month before they died, did not push them to the brink. You know, we all have such a healthy sense of self-preservation. Think about the mother who will, you know, um, jump under that truck and lift the truck to save her baby. Think about how much we when we are thinking in our sane moments, when danger presents itself, we will do everything in our power to save our lives. So if somebody is at the point where they're taking their lives, they are in enormous pain. Yes. Pain we cannot even begin to understand. Yes, and, and um, I completely resonate with what you're saying, that it's got nothing to do with the people around them. When someone um, crosses over, when they cross over through, whether it's by illness or, or they take their own life, it is not the fault of the people around them, you know, because interestingly, somewhat related to that, one of the doctors who was, uh, who was there, who was treating me during the time that I was sick for the couple of years leading up to my NDE, he actually mentioned to me, that when I was in the coma and the other oncologists said this was it and that I was dying and that these were my final hours, he, this doctor who had known me for a couple of years and had been treating me, he actually felt that he had failed me and he started to blame himself because there he thought that was it, I had died. And he literally felt like a failure in those days and in those hours that I was in the coma and in those last couple of days leading to me dying because my, it was as if my fate was sealed, I was going to die. 
And he kept going over and over in his mind how he could have treated in, in terms of treatment. I mean, how he could have done it differently to get, um, to get a different outcome. In other words, he felt really guilty, was blaming himself. And lo and behold, I came out of it. Um, you know, and it was nothing that anybody could have done or changed. But my point being is, had I died, he would have blamed himself because he was saying he should have forced me to take the treatments earlier. And, you know, he was going over in his mind how things could have been different. But what he didn't expect was that I'd come out of the coma and that I would heal. So my point was, <clears throat> that was my soul's purpose. That was my soul's purpose. There was nothing that doctor could have said or done earlier or later to change that outcome. So we can blame ourselves for people taking their lives, but it's not, we don't have that kind of power over people. So what you say is so and true. Yeah, and one more thing I want to say, Anita, is that um, the human brain is always invested in, in um, figuring things out, in computing. When something like this happens that's unexplainable, the mind is scrabbling to find an answer. And the easiest place to go to is self-blame. If I had done something, if I had said something, if we'd mo taken her to another doctor, if I had called every week, this wouldn't have happened. You know, in the absence of a linear, rational explanation, we can very quickly go to self-blame because then at least we have a reason to hang on to. We have something we can hang that coat on. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, we have a question from Susan Ata. How do you move on from loss when it seems like the pain of losing my husband seems to be getting worse instead of better? Oh, Susan. I'm so sorry, Susan, that you're struggling so much through grief. Uh, my heart really goes out to you. A anybody who's grieving a loss who's on this call, I just want you to know I send you a special blessing and a special prayer. Um, you know, there are no magical answers. That's the first thing I will say. Everybody's grief journey is individual. And this is why I don't offer a five-step formula because everybody is different. Every soul is different. Everybody needs a different plan. And so what I want to say to you is, first of all, allow yourself to feel your feelings. Don't do anything that causes you to shut down or not express yourself or make sense of what is happening. We do need to go through that process of wailing and grieving and experiencing the heartbreak. So often we can go to, let's find a meaning, let's find the purpose, let's find an explanation, but there is a place to just be raw and open and cry and grieve. And if that's where you are, I just ask you to honor yourself for exactly where you are. The first thing we need to do is manage emotions. You know, like when there's a burning building and the firemen run into that building, the first thing they do is put out the fire, not look at what caused the fire. We do exactly the opposite. We can go very quickly to sitting down and thinking about, well, what would make me feel better? Why is this happening? What does this remind me of from my childhood? Especially in today's information age, we have access to books and podcasts and lectures and we have all this information, but we're really starving for wisdom. And wisdom is what we need when we are going through the grief experience. And your wisdom can come to you only from your soul. So ask yourself every morning when you get up, what is the most loving thing I can do for myself in this moment? And ask that question of yourself several times a day. And the answer will be different depending on what's going on. Sometimes the answer may be, um, I need a nap. Sometimes it may be I need to pick up the phone and talk to someone who will listen to me. Um, sometimes it may be I just need to sit down with a hot cup of tea. Just keep loving yourself through this experience. That's the most healing thing you can do for yourself when you're grieving such an intense loss like the loss of a spouse. Yeah. Wow. That's that's really beautiful. The the loss of a spouse is, is a big one. I think some of the biggest losses we can have are the loss of a child or, or you know, like a, an, a son or a daughter, an adult, even if they're adults, uh, or the loss of a spouse. Those are the hardest. Those are the hardest ones that I receive letters from people. How do, 
how do they deal with that? Um, we have one from Wendy Matthews. She says, <clears throat> everything you say I know to be true as a life coach and spiritual counselor. However, as a mother whose son took his own life, I still feel all of the emotions that very much challenge, that she still feels very challenging, that challenges what we say. So that's from Wendy. I wonder if she wrote that after you explained about the, but it must be. So have you got anything to say to Wendy who is still dealing with the challenges of her son who took his own life? And if Wendy, Wendy was here, first I, would, I would ask her more questions like, is she feeling guilt or just grief? But anyway, I'll let you take it from here, Oma. Yeah, Wendy, I just want to say how sorry I am that you're still struggling through your grief experience. Um, one of the things that I teach everyone who works with me is to embrace every emotion that comes up. So if anger comes up, just embrace anger. If sadness comes up, embrace sadness. If guilt comes up, embrace guilt. We make our emotions the enemy so often. Our emotions are not our enemy. Our emotions are messengers. They're bringing us useful information that we need to pay attention to. So if, if something comes up, just be there, be present to that emotion. If it's anger, just say, anger, thank you for showing up and what, what's the message you have for me? Every emotion that you embrace will teach you something about yourself. And every little bit of teaching is healing you. You know, so often people think feeling emotions means I'm stuck. That is not true. Every time you allow yourself to feel an emotion, you're actually releasing it. Every time you cry, your bucket of tears is lessening. So don't have judgments about what you're going through um, and, and don't be attached to a timeline. This is another judgment that keeps us, uh, you know, in, in so much uh, suffering that we have to be further along on the journey or someone else is doing so much better. Why am I still struggling? I would say to you, give up the idea of the timeline. Don't attach to a timeline. Just say when you wake up in the morning, um, I'm going to live this day to the best extent that I can and ask yourself, what is the legacy that you can create in the world on behalf of your son who isn't here in physical body to do it? What did your son love? What did your son, you know, long to express or share? Is there some way you can become that legacy creator for him? When, when we consider questions like these, they give us a sense of purpose and they help us get out of that rut of sadness we can uh, find ourselves trapped in. Yeah, and that's great. And, and um, I also liked what you said about if, if she cries, it's, it's a positive thing and, it's, and she's releasing it. And it's not like you're going backwards or that you're not getting it. or the, It's not like the pain has, is getting more. It, every time you cry, every time you accept your pain, every time you accept the grief, you're actually... Um, you're actually getting through it. You're getting further through it, even if it feels like it's yeah. more pain. And and I saw a, ah, okay, so there's a question from Susan Wood. I wanted to just give a shout out to um, to Marilyn Hoffman Fuss. Uh, I just wanted to say, I noticed your comment and your question, but it disappeared before I got to it. So we'll just do one or two more questions, and then I want you to be able to tell the audience where they can find you, um, and you know what, where they can read more about you and maybe join your groups or courses or whatever it is to help them through what the, the pain that they're, going, that they're going through. So f we have a question from Susan Wood who says, how do you overcome the pain and guilt of losing a loved one that you stopped speaking to? Ah, so. That is a very profound question, Susan. Yes. Thank you for asking that because I'm sure many people are going through this. Um, I've worked with so many people who come to me with this um, feeling that, you know, I wish I could, I could have a do-over. They're no longer in physical form and, and I can't make this right somehow. I want you to know that you can make it right. 
there are certain shamanic healing practices and forgiveness practices that I teach my clients. It is very possible for you to energetically correct or amend what you were unable to do, what you didn't know you needed to do while they were still here. And maybe this is the exact lesson you came here to experience. This, this whole idea of self-forgiveness and forgiveness for the other so that, you know, you know, I always like to say, instead of feeling guilty for something that you didn't do right, what if you took that lesson and then taught other people not to do it? You could be saving 10 other people from making the mistake that you did because you got the lesson. This is the true value of a lesson when we get it. We can help so many others. We can stop them from doing what we did. And when we do that, then what happened in our life isn't really a waste because you created so much healing and beauty and harmony in the world because of what you went through. But the first step for you is definitely self-forgiveness. And you can do a ritual of self-forgiveness. You, you, can, you can ask your loved one on the other side um, by writing them a letter, which is the easiest thing to do. You can work with light, lighting a candle, um, doing a ritual in a place of worship, if that speaks to you. Um, if you go to their graveside and do it, that's another way of doing it. You, you can, it can be a very, very healing and cathartic experience. And once you've been able to find that self-forgiveness, then take the lesson of what you learned and teach it to others. That is the most beautiful healing thing that can happen. That's wonderful. And I, I also like to tell people that your loved ones on the other side, they can hear you, they can feel your feelings, they know how you feel, and they want you to be happy again. And you can talk to them and tell them what you wish you had said while they're still alive and, um, and know that they love you unconditionally. So that's, that's really beautiful, Uma. And let's take one last question. And I noticed there's one from my friend, Maureen Heffernan. Hi, Maureen, how are you doing? Um, so Maureen says, I know there is a process we go through in grieving. How do you handle the anger you feel and the hopelessness? That's a great question, the anger. But I guess it, could, it would be similar to what you said before about just accepting and embracing every emotion, right? Yeah, hopelessness comes because of two reasons. Um, well, really two sentences. We have a tendency to say, uh, begin sentences with I'll never, or we begin sentences with I'll always. So this is what it can look like. I'll never be happy again. I'll never find love again. Or I'll always be lonely. I'll always be in this state of debilitating grief. But when, when we can hang on to a word like maybe. Maybe I can find, maybe tomorrow will be a better day. Maybe I'll find a friend who's willing to listen to me. Maybe I'll find my purpose tomorrow. Maybe is a word with a lot of hope. So instead of hopelessness, if you can just say maybe, write down a whole set of maybe sentences. What are your maybe sentences? That gives you more hope instead of putting you in this place of hopelessness. Um, and what was the other thing she asked, Anita? She said anger. anger. Okay. Yes. Anger is many times when we don't allow ourselves to feel our grief, we can go to anger. In our culture, anger is a more permissible emotion than sadness. It's easier to express anger and be noticed and be validated than to express sadness because when you look sad, people tend to move away from you. They don't know what to do with your sadness. Anger, everybody is angry about something, so you have permission to feel anger. Uh, but really, once you, once you walk through the anger, really understand what is below the anger. Beneath the anger is usually fear or grief. So get rid of the anger by expressing it in a healthy way and then find out what is beneath the anger and usually it is some form of fear or sadness and allow these emotions to speak to you i think journaling is a great way for you to connect with these emotions and uh, listen to their messages so i would invite you to try that that's great the those were really fabulous suggestions and answers and i think invaluable for the people tuning in um, so 
tell the audience or let me know what or where can they connect with you? Have you got any upcoming courses or anything that people can join or videos? Tell us everything or anything that you wish. So uh, the easiest way to find me is through my website, which is my first name, last name dot com, umagirish dot com. Um, I have a very active Facebook group. It is called Transform Pain into Purpose. It's a free Facebook group. Um, I only have women there. It's, it just turned out that way. And we're just keeping it as a women only group because it, it the dynamic works well for us. Um, the third thing is I have a challenge, a free challenge that started today on my Facebook page. It's called One Step to Peace Every Day. It's an 11 day challenge. You can come over to my Facebook page and start today. It's just I give you one prompt every single day to help you find more peace in your life. And the last thing I will say is I'm feeling more and more guided to do spiritual mentoring because I find that that is the missing piece in every problem on the planet today, whether it's relationship, money, finances, grief, uh, depression, anything. If when you deepen your connection to the divine, everything takes care of itself. So I in my in the in the grief healing work that I do, it's all about soul centered work. It's about connecting to the divine. It's about healing practices that are very centering. And I feel the urge to move deeper into offering spiritual mentoring. So if that is something you'd love, like to connect with me on, I invite you to come to my website, write to me. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Lots of ways to connect. That's fantastic. And we will, in fact, what we'll do is we'll post a po uh, in the comments below this video we will post your Facebook page so that people can connect with you and feel free to go into the comments um, below this video and to read them, respond to them, whatever you feel. And also I just want to say Rachel Merrington has written and said, thank you. This has been so helpful. I'm sure a lot of people have found this to be very, very helpful. And the work you do, I think more people need to know about it because so many people, they're feeling pain, they're feeling grief. And you're spot on when you say that we live in a culture where grief and sadness is not acceptable and people don't feel welcomed or accepted when they're going through this pain. People, and, and it's not anyone's fault. It's just that they don't know what to do with it. So, That's right. Yeah, there's yeah. not we're not taught about grief. Also, I want to say go buy my book Lessons from Grace. It's on Amazon. <laughs> yes. Lessons from Grace, what a baby taught me about living and loving um, and losing Amma, finding home. That was my first book with Hay House. This was the second book with Hay House India. So all those books are available for you to look at on Amazon. Great. And feel free to put the link to your Amazon books and in the comments as well. So I, I highly recommend them. I haven't read your, <clears throat> I haven't finished your second book yet. I haven't read it. I haven't started it yet. But your first book, I absolutely loved. I read it and I loved it. And so thank you so much for being on. I'm sure I know my audience loved you. Thank you very, very much. And I'm sure I will see you again soon. <laughs> Take thank care. you so much, Anita. This was such a pleasure. Take care. Take care and thank you. And thank you all for tuning in, listening to Uma, and I would highly recommend her. She's very thoughtful, very caring, very heart-centered, and very soul-centered. Just what you need when you're going through a very emotional or tender time in your life. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.